In this video, we are going to cover how to process the UV visible spectral data that we can collect uh, at the SSRL microprobe beamlines. Uh, at these beamlines, we have equipped uh, the sensors with a ocean optics spectrophotometer. Uh, we have a beam splitter that takes the optical microscope image and attaches that with a fiber optic to the spectrometer and we can get the UV visible spectra from about a 5 micron spot on the sample. Uh, with careful alignment with you or your beamline scientist, we can align this so that you are collecting the UV spectrum from the exact spot that the X-ray beam is uh, hitting your sample. Uh, in this way, we can then collect multimodal data, both the X-ray spectra and the UV visible spectrum at the same time. Uh, so in here, we will show you how we treat this data uh, at SSRL and how we can process it to get some color information. And I will show you a few examples of different things you can do with that particular data set. Um, now, typically, uh, the data is stored as a full spectrum across the UV visible wavelengths. And this is actually very akin to the MCA spectra that you collect with the X-ray fluorescence, say, on the Express 3 electronics that was covered in an earlier video. And we'll use some of the exact same methods to do this processing. So the first thing we are going to do is open up a data file that is appropriate. And here I have some uh, color swatches that uh, my kids and I painted together and then later X-rayed. And here is our paint swatch and we can look and we see that there are some copper paints there are some titanium based pigments and some cadmium based pigments as well um, now we want to correlate our elemental signals to our color signals of course uh, so the first thing we need to do is take the raw spectra that we have we have in the same way that we have the mca spectra for every line uh, we also have a very similar HDF file for every UV visible spectrum for every line. And we need to assemble that at, into a quality uh, single file. I'm going to gum here. I'm going to use a higher degree of compression so we save some disk space. So I'll use the GZIP9 for doing this. And just like before when we would say uh, construct an Express 3 HDF, we will now go down to the color support menu and we will construct an HDF from the ocean optics maps. Now just like we can do this for a mapping uh, data set, we can also do this for XAS. The uh, beamlines at SSRL are also set up to be able to collect a spectrum at every single pixel, or every single point, energy point in a XAS spectrum. Um, and so the same uh, program here can then parse either the XAS data or the map data. Since we're working with maps here, we'll worry about this first. Uh, again, just like in the MCA spectra, we will pick any particular file out of the, um, any particular line out of the file that we're interest, interested in. I'm gonna grab that one. And it will now go through and ask us some questions. It first asks us if this is a bi-directional scan. Um, were we doing bi-directional or continuous? In this case, the answer is no. And it will now go through and read all of the data files and uh, add them into a single corresponding HDF file that contains all of the spectral information. Uh, this may take a few minutes depending on the size of your image. And we will say that time is passing as it parses all of the data files. And now we can see that we have magically finished the end of the parsing. Uh, this took a little bit longer than we may have expected. So in real time, this took uh, approximately two minutes to complete. Uh, now we'll have created this new data file and if just like again just like with the MCA spectrum we can define this file 
we're going to define it as the MCA file, but it'll really be our spectral data. And uh, we'll scroll down and we'll find the new file that's been created by this process, and it is this MCA file right here. We'll open that up. And now, just as we did again with the uh, full spectrum data, we can say view MCA. If we click on any particular spot on the sample, not only do we get the cross-section area of how that particular channel looks like, but now we also get the MCA, but in this case, the UV visible spectrum taken at that pixel. Um, all the other features that we have with MCA uh, also work with the UV visible here, so we can average uh, several pixels together by using the shift key to select an area and say what does the spectrum look like in this particular area by saying MCA here. And that creates a slightly smoother spectra because it is averaging several. And we can do the same tricks with saying let's put this into a buffer and now go to buffer 2 and compare the area that is down in this section. We say MCA there, and now we can look at the difference between two different areas. If we wanted to process or rebin things later on, we can switch back and forth force be between these buffers. Um, it's one thing to be able to look at the uh, UV visible spectra. Uh, these are in units of bin number, which again aren't very useful. Uh, if you know the calibration curve of the spectrophotometer, we can change this into wavelengths of nanometers. Um, but the program is already calibrated to deal with this, and we can actually convert this into normal, more normal color coordinates. So here we can say convert the UV spectrum uh, MCA files in either RGB coordinates, which are your normal RGB color space, uh, XYZ primitive color coordinates, or LAB color coordinates. If you're not familiar with the LAB system, I'm going to bring this window up here for just one moment. That's a very useful uh, color system where the L coordinate is the luminosity. So positives are lighter, uh, negative numbers are darker. The A axis goes between green and red, and the B axis goes between blue and yellow. Um, so I'm just going to leave that there for a minute. You can always come back to that later on, but we, we can always then imagine how the colors are changing by how this LAB coordinate system is uh, being changed. Uh, in one of our applications later on, we'll actually look at that in more detail. Okay, so let's do the color support here, and we're going to convert this image into RGB information. So we collect that there. Uh, the one thing it will ask you is the data dwell time. Uh, in this case, it is 100 milliseconds, but if you don't know what it is a priori, you can go into the uh, data logs and see the record of the dwell time that's been collected. Uh, again, this will now go through all of the data and process and integrate the spectrum to make what your eye would see by red, green, and blue. This process also takes a few minutes, so in a few minutes we will have our answer. Okay, so some time has passed now and the calculations are now complete. We can scroll down and see that we have now channels for the red, green, and blue parts of the spectrum. To actually put this in an easy way to visualize, we can now go to the tricolor plots and visualize this as red. Move this over here green, and blue. And now we have a true visual representation of the colors that are in that sample. And they, they match very well with, say, uh, the elements that we are also looking at. Move that here. Uh, so we look at, say, the copper distribution matches very well with the green section of paint over here. The titanium bits here match very well with the white bits of paint right there. 
Uh, the red here was uh, or an organic lake compound, so it does not have a good uh, compositional signature in the transition metals. And the cadmium there shows up here in this, these little bits in between in the yellows, a cadmium yellow. Uh, so we have a really good distribution of now both color and the elements that are corresponding to that color. Uh, so this is a great way to use the uh, UV visible sp um, spectrometer to actually look at the color of the sample. And this is a as pixel resolution image of your sample. And I we find that this is actually a much higher resolution in terms of getting that 5 micron or 2 micron resolution than the actual image capture of the sample itself. So if nothing else, if you're looking for a true color representation of your hyperspectral image of your data, this is the best way to capture that image. So we have also designed it so that we can actually save all of this red, green, blue information directly into the data collector so that if you are inter interested into the RGB data, you do not have to go through all of the MCA UV visible files in order to look at your data. Uh, when you open one of these files, it will look like this. Here we go. I think I want... I actually want C. There we go. And here are some uh, spots of some paints that have been placed on a piece of paper. And now you will see that you have the red, green, and blue channels directly into your data collector, just as you would have any of the other channels. And so there's red, uh, green, and blue. And in the same sense, we can go to the tricolor plots again and look at how this is in terms of red, green, and blue and see the color representation of these little paint splotches on the background piece of paper. Uh, this saves you a lot of time, so you don't have to spend those uh, minutes and minutes of trying to process the raw spectral data. But if you do want to use a coordinate system like the LAB, you will need to do this manually through the MCA data. Now, an interesting case of uh, how we've actually used the LAB data can be presented here. Uh, this is a case where we were looking at the a sample and we did a full spectral map of looking at the composition in terms of the elements that are present uh, before uh, zanes were taken. Uh, this is a lead paint sample so here is the lead distribution and we measured the color distribution both before and after several Zanes points were collected. Uh, we have the LAB coordinates here, and both pre and after the Zanes collection. So that's LAB pre, LAB after. And we also did the RGB coordinates once just so you could have the normal uh, color coordinate that you may be used to. So here's what the RGB looks like. RGB, and you see that we have actually have a lead paint that we've mixed in some uh, crimson uh, red lakes uh, pigments into as well. And they have a color gradient from pure lead into the darker reds. And this looks uh, just fine, but now if you want to compare the pre and post, if you look at the uh, LAB coordinates, you can see the pre-L coordinate. This is the overall luminosity and compare that to after here. And if you are really quick and you noticed, you may have seen spots here, here, and I believe up here that have changed between the pre and post sample. It's actually right there. Pre and post. So we can use a tricolor plot to help us visualize this as well. So I'm going to put the pre-colors in red. I'm going to put the post-luminosity color. Okay, pre in red. Where are we here? Pre in red and post in green and blue. And so if the colors here were the same, 
between the end and the beginning, everything would look white. I'm going to adjust these colors just a little bit. I'm going to do a edge removal to get rid of the uh, oddities on the edges. I will reload defaults. And now look at this. And you can see here now we've normalized the color to the data here. And if the pre and the post were exactly the same, we would see all white because the RGB coordinates would be the same. Instead, we see these locations of more intense red. And if I enhance this just a little bit by going to 30 and 30 here, up 30. Uh, you can really see this uh, spot here show up well, as, uh, a little bit better as well. So this is showing that the luminosity in the pre is stronger than the luminosity in the post. Uh, and this suggests that there's been darkening due to the x-ray exposure of taking several Zanes points at each of these positions here. So we can actually use our UV visible spectrometer information as a way to characterize if there's been any damage or scarring on the sample. And we can even characterize what exactly is happening in a hyperspectral color way. And we can even compare this on the other coordinates. So if you remember the A coordinate, we can do that with the A coordinate as well and see the same kind of changes occurring. And here again, we see that the A coordinate is going to more negative positions. Uh, and the more negative positions in the A coordinate are going from a reddish, reddish colors to the bluish colors. So we're getting we're doing a darkening blue-black uh, change as we uh, hit the sample with X-rays for long periods of time. So this is a great way to actually get quantitative information. Uh, you can also do this with several images over time and actually get the changes in the color coordinates. And when we have this with our actual uh, XAS spectra, we can quantify this with each pixel in the actual spectra and see what is changing. Uh, so I hope this shows you the power of what we can do with the UV visible spectrophotometers and how you can actually begin to look at color data in a hyperspectral way. Now, there's a lot more we can do, and there's, the sky is almost the limit here. Uh, we can begin to process both the spectral data along with the elemental data and do PCA methods and clustering methods. Uh, a lot of this is uh, new territory and how to uh, analyze these multimodal data sets. Uh, and I hope you will uh, stay tuned to some of the developments that we're working on to see how this can be best applied for your particular science application. Uh, thanks for watching.